The mid-2010s were a great period for the World Endurance Championship. Three of the world's largest car brands in Audi, Porsche and Toyota competing with some amazing 1000 horsepower hybrid rocket chips not too far off the pace of that era's F1 cars. Some great racing and iconic moments that will live long in the memory of sports car fans. However, whilst all of this was indeed wonderful, there was a slight issue. The budget for these programs was in and around $300 million. That is a lot, of course, particularly if you were to compare it to Formula E at the time, a series that was showcasing electric technology at a much smaller cost, with a spec chassis being used universally across the grid. This cost-saving measure was too tempting for Audi and Porsche, who jumped ship from the WEC in 2016 and 17 respectively, with Toyota willing to soldier on. This though put the future of WEC in crisis. Okay, well, maybe not quite crisis, but it was certainly in a precarious state, let's put it that way. It in essence meant Toyota would face the prospect of being up against privateer efforts, which didn't utilise any hybrid technology, arguably in a competition of their own, until a brand based in the English city of Leeds announced plans of its own. Ginetta may have a history that goes back to their formation in 1958, but their recent prominence in racing began in the mid-2000s, building small sports cars that would be used for one leg racing categories. All of which was the brainchild of keen racer and businessman Lawrence Tomlinson. His efforts on making Ginetta more prominent on the racing stage worked to get in a company out of the financial peril that the company had gotten itself in. Wait, a small British car company having financial difficulties? I've never heard of anything like that whatsoever. Safe and sound investments are usually what they are. Everything has been going fairly smoothly for the brand since, with this range of race-prepared sports cars resonating with several people. They were even the creators of the LMP3 class, a class that is loved universally across the entire sports car fan base. However, Tomlinson wanted more though. Lawrence had competed at Le Mans via his Team LNT team, and was even a class winner in the 2006 edition, winning the GT2 class in a Panels Esperante GTLM of all vehicles, What's more is that Ginetta partnered with engineering firm Zytec to create their snappily titled GZ09S They would compete in the LMP1 class for 2009 and 10, with one of the cars even being piloted by Nigel Mansell, as well as sons Greg and Leo. However, it wasn't all that competitive and crashed with Nigel at the wheel in the early portions of the race with a puncture. All this was what fueled the fire to return to the LMP1 ranks with something more competitive. Tomlinson even said that it was an obvious thing for us to look at. We've always looked at the top category and I think every manufacturer looks at the top category at Le Mans. And so it was announced on the 4th of January 2017 that Ginetta would enter the LMP1 ranks of the World Endurance Championship for 2018 with a car called the G60 LT P1. Still hadn't found a way to come up with a snappy model name but that doesn't really matter. This effort was obviously being taken seriously, especially if you were to take into account the people that had been employed to make this project as successful as possible. Paolo Cattoni was brought in after designing other successful MP1 cars such as the Peugeot 908. Another design consultant in Adrian Reynard also joined. Plus there was an extensive testing program along with Williams Advanced Engineering doing wind tunnel testing and analysis. No wonder the team's head of aerodynamics would be a former Williams engineer in Andy Lewis. Of the announcement, Tomlinson said, I'm hugely thankful to the ACO for the opportunity to run at the front and challenge for overall podiums. With Adrian and Paolo on board, the performance of the Ginetta LMP1 is going to be amazing. It will take Ginetta to our highest ever level of motorsport, and what better time to do it than at the start of our 60th year of manufacturing. And we are very confident that our customers have made the correct choice and that this car will bring global success for them and for us. Just to clap on the quote unquote customer front, Ginetta would be making the cars but wouldn't run a team themselves. The team that were confirmed to be running a car for the 2018 19 WEC season would be TRS Racing Manor. Yes, that is the same manor that competed in F1 during 2015, but not 2016, which I would explain, but this video doesn't have a spare 7 minutes of time for me to describe why. Anyway, the president of the ACO, Pierre Fion, welcomed Ginetta by saying, Ginetta has proven its expertise in creating successful high performance chassis in the G57 and Ginetta LMP3 categories, and entering LMP1, the top tier category of endurance racing, appears now to be an obvious move for Ginetta as it moves forward. 
so they were apparently ready to jump in right to the deep end, bypassing LMP2 completely. After being launched at the Autosport International Show in Birmingham, the car would have its first rollout on the fearsome yet world-renowned racetrack called Leeds East Airport, and it would have the following mouth-watering statistics. 833 kilograms in weight, all helped from its carbon fibre monocoque, a 7-speed extract sequential gearbox, carbon ceramic brakes from AP Racing, and 650 horsepower, coming from a turbocharged 3.4-litre V6 engine developed by Mechachrome. But, like most of the other LMP1 entries, there would be no hybrid system. The cost of all of this? £1.34 million, along with an extra £594,000 required for an engine lease and technical support. Over time, a swathe of driver announcements would be made for the two-car effort, none of which were Robert Kubica, who had tested the car. For the first round at Spa, Car 5 would have a three-driver lineup in Charlie Robertson, Leo Roussel and Freedom 100 winner Dean Stoneman, whilst Car 6 would have three drivers also in Alex Brundle, Oliver Rowland and Oliver Turvey. Rowland said, I can't wait to get started with the team to ensure we get the best out of the package and moving forward seeing if we can challenge for some fantastic results in the championship. Meanwhile Brundle said, I have been lucky enough to enjoy success at the highest level in LMP2 cars, both at Le Mans and in the WEC so I feel ready and excited to make the natural progression to LMP1. With enormous amounts of anticipation in the air and a decent pre-season prologue at Paul Ricard, the cars headed for the first round of the season at Spa. But when they got there, they ran no timed laps all weekend, before being withdrawn from the race. Just in and out laps were completed, although this wasn't seemingly down to any technical issues whatsoever. After not initially giving a reason as to why, an explanation did come out from Ginetta. Unfortunately, funds promised have not arrived from TRS China to CEFC TRSM Racing UK. The required funds for Ginetta were due some time ago, and whilst we understand that TRS China has been working with its sponsors to sort the issues, without payment, Ginetta cannot allow the cars to race. Ginetta remains committed to working with CEFC TRSM Racing UK on this programme. We are aware that CEFC TRSM Racing has visited TRS many times in China and can also confirm that TRS have visited Ginetta three times recently, the last time to attend a royal visit. We have been informed by TRS that the current situation is a short-term cash flow problem and that the main funds are in place for payment before Le Mans. Things had already gotten a bit off kilter by how Leo Roussel had been taken off the entry list for the number 5 car. However, as debuts for a new race car go, this is perhaps one of the worst there has ever been. I mean, at least the 1997 Lolo F1 car actually managed to go around the track in Australia several times. Thankfully, the Ginettas were on the entry list for Le Mans, and did get to do time lapse. The drivers were the same for car 6, but Dean Stoneman wasn't back in the number 5, so Leo Roussel and Michael Simpson would be alongside Charlie Robertson. Unfortunately though, of the lap times they did set, they weren't very fast. On the first day of on-track action, they logged 59 laps, most of which were down to the plethora of mechanical gremlins they had, mainly with the engine, firstly with a configuration problem, and then the entire engine in the number 6 car having to be replaced. When the car was running though, its speed was lacking. Really lacking. In fact, it was the slowest of all the LMP1 cars, and was behind the pole-sitting Toyota by 8.3 seconds. Or at least, that was the fate of the number 6 car. The number 5 entry was even worse off, 9.8 seconds off pole, and being behind 4 of the LMP2 cars on speed. The car's biggest issue was its straight line performance. It was the slowest of all the prototypes in the speed traps, and that includes all of the LMP2 runners by the way. Really and truly, this was going to be a big test session for the Ginettas, as even compared to the other privateer LMP1 efforts, they were struggling. Graham Loudon, the team's sporting director, said after the first day, all in all, a huge amount of effort, and not much in return. But if he thought that qualifying was a struggle, those struggles weren't even scratching the surface when it came to the 24 hours. The team may have ultimately wanted this race to be a test session, but it certainly wasn't smooth running. Let's talk about car 6. After having a reasonably good start, thanks to cars ahead of them having contact and troubles of their own, 
Its race fell apart after the completion of round one. A stop and go penalty for Alex Brundle after spinning the wheels, leaving his previous pit stop didn't help. But just before hour nine was completed, an issue at the rear of the car put the vehicle in the garage for half an hour. But when it came back out, the car stopped at Tetra Rouge and then on the main straight between the two Mulsan chicanes. With Le Mans rule stating that any car that couldn't make it to the pit lane without assistance being declared out of the race, the team went as far as sending mechanics out to the side of the barrier, sending instructions to driver Oliver Rowland to try and at least get the car back to the pits. However, after over an hour of trying to find a way to restart the car, it wouldn't fire up, therefore retiring from the race. Then there was car five. The drama started almost immediately, having to spend two and a half minutes in the pit lane for potentially loose front bodywork. Then, just before the completion of the fourth hour, whilst the race was under safety car, Leo Roussel lost it and hit the wall while warming up his tyres. And whilst they kept going, replacing some of the front bodywork swiftly afterwards, this knock would have a knock-on effect for the rest of the race. Just before the eighth hour, it would head for the garage in what was initially thought to be a puncture until it was discovered to be a more serious issue. Having gotten repaired again, the left side number panel had to be replaced. Then, after a couple of hours of garageless time, a problem developed in the bell housing. A couple of hours after that, it went back into the garage for further repairs. I could go on, and I will. An alternator problem put it in the garage prior to the last hour, and would continue to plague them in the final hour, along with battery issues. But mercifully, they would make it to the finish line. Sure, they were 99 laps down on the winner, and they had a rather turbulent time of it, but they at least made it. Except they weren't 99 laps down, as one of their drivers, Leo Roussel, didn't get beyond their minimum drive time, so were docked an incredibly specific penalty of 6 laps plus 2 minutes 45 seconds, 0.613. On the whole, a very miserable Le Mans experience for the Ginetta, and its performance at Le Mans may or may not have influenced the decision on the car. For the upcoming round of the WEC of the company's home race at Silverstone, Ginetta decided that a change of engine was required to get their performance up a notch. After ditching the Mechachrome V6, it was onto the AERP60B 2.4 litre twin turbo V6. However, this change led to another problem. Ginetta apparently didn't notify the FIA in time about its change of power unit for the car to be rehomologated for Silverstone, the time period being 30 days before an event began. The team said in a statement, Ginetta is hugely disappointed by this outcome, as the manufacturer had ensured everything was in place to deliver a competitive car ready for the manufacturer and team's home race. However, Megachrome didn't seem too pleased with this change. Their motorsports director, Bruno Angeric, said, There were regular complaints over the engine not being powerful enough in comparison to other units on the market. But from day one, Ginetta and Megachrome had agreed that the main objective was to finish Le Mans with the original engine specification. We are surprised by Ginetta and Manor's choice to go with an engine which has been developed for years, yet failed to finish at Le Mans in June. Also, commercial relations had gotten strained, so it was fair to say that things weren't all that rosy between them. But no matter, once the new car was re-homologated, it would be ready for Fuji in a couple of months. Until Manor decided to end its involvement with the entry for commercial reasons, with TRSM now having to look elsewhere for its Ginetta to be run and it seemed as though Ginetta themselves would be willing to assist them, yet they would be absent from the round in Fuji with the car apparently not ready. Yet they would also be absent from the round in Shanghai a month later. TRSM would later not be running the Ginettas at all. Tomlinson said, We're just waiting for them to come up with the money, but I think we've waited long enough to say that clearly they haven't met their obligations to the team, so the team can't meet their obligations to us. Therefore the cars are back at the factory. This later meant that Ginetta themselves were, within all likelihood, going to be tasked with operating the entry. And I do mean just entry, not entries, as the plan was for the number 5 card to be removed after the European leg of the calendar. They were, though, looking for new potential customers to come forward and run the car, but it wouldn't be at the next round of Sebring due to logistical concerns. Now yes, I know what all of you are probably thinking at this point. Okay, maybe just a few of you at the very most. So we've gotten quite a long way into this video, and most of that time has been spent talking about multiple different factors as to why a Ginetta LMP1 car hasn't been able to race. And unfortunately, I have more to say on that front. With no customers seemingly wanting to use the Ginettas, 
The company themselves put forward an entry for the second round at Spa of the season, as well as the second Le Mans 24 hours of the season. However, WEC wouldn't let them race. Why? Well, as the full season entry had missed a number of races, it had occurred a number of fines. Fines which the previous team, CEFC TRSM, hadn't yet paid. Now, you'd think that given the Genettas were now back under the company's control, that they could still be used. Except for how one-off entries weren't allowed in the LMP1 class that season. So despite having submitted their intention to race, it was a long shot that they'd be able to compete. Tomlinson said of this development, We've invested very heavily in this rule set and have stayed true to the regulations, both with the cars and with the way in which the program has been conducted. The commercial issues were not of our making. We have simply tried to navigate around and through them to retain a competitive package for a successor customer. So, with them not competing at the last two rounds, the Ginetta G60 LTP1 competed in one race, withdrew for a multitude of reasons for the rest of the events, had one car get to the finish of the one event it did do, with multiple issues along the way, with the other car retiring, not be all that competitive when they weren't having issues, change engine supplier after that low race, and not getting to see how the new engine would fare against its competition. All in all, an utterly horrendous season, if you could even call it a season. However, plans were still in place to get both Genettas entered into the following season. The question is though, would they? It's the 1st of September 2019, and the field was ready to begin a new WEC season at the Silverstone 4 hours. And two Genettas were on the grid. Ran by Team LNT, but I guess also a fully backed Genetta entry given the connections, the cars would be competing in the six-car LMP1 class, with two Toyotas and two Rebellions, albeit one part-time. Driver-wise, it was the massively underrated Ben Hanley, Igor Arutchev and Charlie Robertson. Whilst in car six, it was Michael Simpson, Oliver Jarvis and 2003 Le Mans winner with Bentley, Guy Smith. Although Jarvis' place was actually meant to be picked up by Chris Dyson, but he injured his wrist in a Trans Am crash at Road America. The cars had completed some testing before the season began, with Simpson saying, This was my first opportunity to sample the car since we switched to the AER engine, and it has transformed the car. In qualifying, the Genettas were last of the LMP1 cars, but not by all that much. They were 1.2 and 1.4 seconds respectively off of the pole time set by the number 7 Toyota. Okay, maybe they were still a little bit off, but certainly if you were to compare it to their previous outing at Le Mans, on qualifying pace alone, they were in a completely different galaxy. Of course, one that pace is one thing, but how would they get on in the race? Well, having a moment on the formation lap isn't the most nerve settling of beginnings. Initially, an utterly torrid start, after getting almost swamped by all of the LMP2s, although they would have enough pace to get by them with relative ease later on. When the race started to generate a bit of a rhythm, however, and all of the LMP1 cars were running by themselves, even the Rebellions were pulling away from the G60 LTP1s. However, that would be the last of Ginetta's concerns, as Mike Simpson would lose a wheel in the number 5 car, leaving it trundling around for half a lap in its tricycle configuration. Plus, GTE traffic caused a close call, and ultimately, contact with the 71 AF Corsa Ferrari. Oliver Jarvis and the number 6 would continue, which is more than can be said for the Ferrari, but would incur damage to the car, which would have to be repaired, and cost it time. Couple that with a drive through penalty for not following the students' instructions, and it would result in a result of last in LMP1, 17 laps down. Meanwhile, the number 5 car would run the rest of the race to 4th in class, 4 laps down. Although they would get a podium from this race, as the rebellion ahead of them wasn't a full season entry, meaning out of the full time entries, they'd be classified 3rd. Finally, after so much misery and anguish and just simply not racing at all, a small crumb of success had been achieved. Optimism perhaps for the 6 hours of Fuji coming up next? For Fuji, there was a shuffle round driver wise. In car 5, Hanley and Arutchev would be joined by Formula 2 regular Luca Giotto, making his sports car debut. Robertson would now be driving car 6 with Michael Simpson and Guy Smith. Qualifying showed some good signs of performance. The number 6 car was just above half a dozen hundredths of one of the Toyotas. However, they wouldn't start behind them as Charlie Robertson spun and didn't set a lap time, meaning they'd be starting at the back. Now, that does sound somewhat confusing, I know, 
But the explanation why this was the case is far too long-winded, especially considering it's not all that interesting. It's worth pointing out that the Toyota speed after Silverstone had been wound down somewhat, meaning the privateer efforts had a bit more of a chance. Except the Ginettas still couldn't quite keep up the pace. They weren't a million miles off, but they still didn't quite have long stint pace to really worry the other cars. That being said though, they still suffered issues during the race, which made the performance look even worse. The number 6 car suffered a spin at the hairpin and got a puncture at the least convenient spot on the track to suffer one, crawling back to the pits around the entire 4.5km circuit. It's miserable time compounded by a 6 minute penalty on pit road for a technical infringement, leaving it 14 laps down. All the while for car 5, its race would be ruined by the front left brake giving way at turn 1, which if these close up shots of the glowing brake discs and streaks of brake dust behind the front wheels are anything to go by, it's not too much of a surprise. This left them 16 laps down. With that, it was on to Shanghai for the 4 hour race there. Driver lineups were the same, bar one change. So they weren't the same after all. Giotto would be making way for former IndyCar racer Jordan King in car 5, who seemed very excited to be given the chance to drive this car if this statement is anything to go by. I've been watching their efforts closely in the early part of the season, and it is very clear that there is massive potential here. I hope I can help them unlock even more of that in Shanghai. Well, would they? Ah, you see, before we look at the answer to that question, I feel it's important to note something else here. Prior to the weekend, there was some balance of performance changes made to both the Toyota and the Rebellion. The Toyota, which had already been brought down in speed prior to the Fuji race, was made even slower. 2.74 seconds slower, in fact, per lap. The Rebellion was made 0.89 seconds slower. This was down to the distance championship standings-wise between all the LMP1 entries. As the Ginettas weren't keeping up, the rest of the field was handicapped to give them more of a chance. Now this certainly impacted the Toyotas in terms of one lap speed, but not the Rebellion, which ended up 1.2 seconds faster than both Ginettas in qualifying although at least it enabled the Ginetta to top a wet session in free practice too. Now, this parity certainly did help close the field together, and it brought Ginetta to be able to lead a race for the first time. However, despite a bit better parity in terms of performance, Ginetta couldn't quite put all the pieces together to get a good result. Firstly, they were penalised for jumping the start, then had some shoddy pit stops throughout pretty much the whole race. But potentially its biggest Achilles heel was the cars not being able to look after their tyres towards the latter half of a tyre stint. So despite the cars being closer in performance, the G60 LTP1s still finished as the bottom two LMP1 cars in the class. Sure cars 5 and 6 were comparatively speaking 1 and 2 laps down respectively, but it was potentially a missed opportunity. On to the 8 hours of Bahrain and there was another driver shuffle. Hanley, Robertson and King would be in car 5 whilst car 6 would have Simpson, Smith and Chris Dyson who was finally making his debut with Ginetta. After having a wrist injury, Trans Am slash WEC scheduling conflicts and business commitments to scupper his chances of racing in the previous three rounds, Chris was raring to go for his return to LMP1 machinery. Bahrain finishing at night under the floodlights will be a new experience for me. I'll be pushing as hard as I can to deliver on the clear potential of the Ginetta AER package. So how would his and the rest of the Ginetta drivers weekends go? In qualifying terms, not too bad at all. The number 5 Ginetta being just under a tenth and a half of the pole sitting rebellion. With further success handicaps on its competitors, the team was aware that this would be their best chance yet at a win. I think execution is definitely key to it because we've now proven that we've got the pace in the car and the drivers. If we've got the chance, we need to grasp it really. All hopes of a win though lasted basically up until the second corner. Robertson lost the rear end on the inside of Bruno Senna, spinning the Rebellion around and causing the Ginetta to have some damage to its rear wing assembly, which cost the team two laps trying to repair the damage. However, far worse was to come later in the race. Not that Simpson was aware of that, of course. In the latter half of the race, the number five ground to a halt on track, with the car's electronics glitching out somewhat. Meanwhile, car six also retired from the race with gearbox gremlins. This would be the first retirement of the season for these cars, at the event that they had the best chance of getting a good result out of so far this season. So with that disappointment behind them, it was off to Kota with a Lone Star Le Mans event. 
As the field started their formation lap, the Ginettas weren't there. Oh no, what's going on now then? You see, what I've not so far told you is that a couple of weeks prior to this event, Ginetta said that they'd be redrawing from the round of Kota. The reason that was given was the following. The number 5 and number 6 G60 LTP1 cars needed significant planned maintenance after Bahrain. The WEC calendar is challenging, especially for any team with a new car in its first season, and we have not had the chassis back at the factory since before Silverstone in August. The cancellation of the earlier WEC race in Brazil and the new race at Cota made it impossible to do the planned work at our facility in Virginia, so the cars were shipped post-race back to Ginetta in the UK. The cars will hopefully arrive at the factory. So seemingly, operational difficulties were the factors in this case. However, with the next few rounds being back in Europe, this seemed like just a one-off. But then, the pandemic struck, which, among several other things, caused the wet calendar to be changed. Spa was now taking place in August. Yet the Ginettas didn't appear on the entry list, with no reason initially being given. A couple of days later though, Tomlinson said why they decided to withdraw. Our primary focus has to be to get our core business and customer base back up to speed and stable, and with a shutdown enforced backlog, that means our workflow has been significantly impacted. We had a pretty extensive job list of rebuild, repair and a number of upgrades too to sort of part of our reign, so we flew the cars back in time to sort that for into Lagos, which was then cancelled. That led us to missing the replacement race at Kota, but we flew the cars out for Sebring which was then cancelled, with the team into shutdown well before the cars came back. Put all of that together, and we have spent a big chunk of money not racing. Tomlinson also said how the pandemic and calendar alterations had hit the programme hard financially too. In fact, it was a hit so hard that it was revealed that Ginetta had no plans to enter the G60 LTP1s for next season in the WEC, and that the final round in Bahrain wouldn't be something they'd be doing either. There was still a plan to at least enter one Ginetta into the Le Mans 24 hours after Spa, however that didn't happen as well. Tomlinson went on to say, sorry, I, I know I'm doing quite a lot of quotes in this portion of the video, I do apologise, went on to say, I do things that make me money, or make me happy, and racing in the WEC does neither. And if I'm honest, it's not hard to see why Lawrence wouldn't be happy with what the Ginetta LMP1 programme had achieved. Or you could argue, what the Ginetta LMP1 hadn't achieved. It had spent its time struggling to finalise customer deals, later the company themselves having to run it, and said customer deal not having the financial security to complete the programme with ease in the first place, leading to only one race being done with the car in its first season, with the rest being skipped due to late payments, a change of power unit suppliers after one race, oh yeah, that happened as well, thus late homologation, the customer team not yet paying the skipped race fines, and the intended one-off entries run in essence by Ginetta themselves, not allowed. Yet when the car was on track, its competitiveness to the likes of Rebellion and initially by Collez was somewhat disappointing. And whilst the new engine did seem to improve its fortune, the Toyotas and Rebellions had to be handicapped fairly heavily to just give the Ginettas a fighting chance. Yet when the others were slowed down, the team couldn't quite put all the elements together to pull off a confidence-boosting result, along with reliability, raising its perhaps rare, but certainly revolting head. Not to mention how the driver lineups, for almost every race they did, there was usually at least one driver that wasn't going to be racing one of the Ginettas at the next event. I'm not saying that the drivers who drove the car weren't capable automobile pilots, very much the opposite. However, having a consistent lineup that can build chemistry up between drivers is an important factor when it comes to endurance racing. Really and truly, this was about as bad as Ginetta's revived LMP1 attempt could have gone. Maybe not the worst programme that I've covered in these mini documentaries when it comes to a lack of competitiveness, but considering the amount of time that I've spent talking about the car when it wasn't racing, you perhaps wouldn't be surprised to think that this would be something that Janetta would want to forget about quickly. Yet, you would be wrong. At the Janetta G-Fest at Silverstone this year, done to celebrate 65 years of Vauxhall, the LMP1, okay I'm not fooling anyone with that am I, the LMP1 Janetta was run once again, in a sort of demonstration session, if you like. It was being run pretty hard as well, which is always pleasant to see. Now, there may be some of you saying, why are they running their unsuccessful and not all that fast LMP1 machine at an event that's meant to celebrate this great brand's history? My succinct response to that is, why not? 
Of course, this car's life was rather troublesome, and perhaps it could have done better had the car been able to have done some more testing slash race time prior to the 2019-20 WEC season. Yes, I know they were competing with the Rebellion and Toyotas in the last couple of races, but that was purely because of how the series slowed the others down, rather than the Genettas getting much faster. And plus, this way of increasing their competitiveness is also a rather controversial one. Anyway, I'm kind of going off on a needless tangent here. My point is, is that just because the car wasn't brilliant doesn't mean it deserves to be hidden away deep in an underground storage area below the Genetta factory. It's great that they're reminding people of what this company has done, because by Genetta standards, this is one of the most advanced cars they've ever created. Plus, bear in mind that whilst in the racing world they're a very big deal, from a financial standpoint, Toyota puts them into oblivion, and Ginetta's road car portfolio is almost non-existent. Beating the Toyotas was always going to be highly unlikely when both machines weren't restricted in some form. The non-hybrid route was always going to be a struggle, yet its pace compared to other privateer lmp ones was quite disappointing, yet really none of this particularly bothers me. I'm just glad it exists, and that the company seem happy to shout about it. They're even content with putting the car into the recently released Forza Motorsport game, which is fantastic. A cool and obscure race car being put into one of the racing game industry's biggest titles. So, Forza, if you're watching this, is there any scope to perhaps get cars like the Jaguar and Lotus GT vehicles in the future? That though is thankfully going to be it for this video, thank you very much for watching, and if you've gone to the end of this video through its entirety, then well done, I hope you've been able to digest all the information that I've thrown at you. And if you didn't watch this entire video, then if I'm being completely honest, I don't blame you at all. If you have any other forgotten racing projects that you'd like to see me do videos on, then say down in the comment section below, along with your thoughts on this particular Ginetta LMP1 car. Also, this video took around 100 plus hours to make, so whilst I don't really like plugging about my channel at all, if you did enjoy this video, then I would be incredibly appreciative if you did hit the like and subscribe buttons, plus why not hit the notification bell icon next to the subscribe button so you can be notified in an instant that I've made yet more long-winded mediocre content. However, until the next video, be kind to each other and enjoy the rest of your day.